the sea can mean different things to different people. For many of us, it's days out, weekends away at the coast, flake 99s on the beach, and memories of summer. For artists, it's a great form of inspiration. And living on the coast, I can tell you there are many times in better weather you can see someone sitting down with a drawing pad or a canvas and easel looking out to sea. But for those who make their living on the waves, it can be unpredictable and deadly. None know this more than the fishermen. You sail from the ports all over the country, although nowhere in the numbers they once did. The subject of our presentation today had a unique position to view the sea, both as a fisherman and as an artist. His name was John Crask, and he is one of Norfolk's most overlooked artists, and his relationship with the sea would undoubtedly save his life. John Crask was born on the 6th of July 1881 in the coastal town of Sheringham, North Norfolk, to Edward and Hannah Crask. To say he was born into a fishing family would be an understatement. The Crasks had been working in fishing since as long as anyone could remember. In fact, the Crask in general had been in East Anglia seemingly forever, tracing their name back to the Latin Crask, meaning good health and spirits, something that would be slightly ironic with John's life to come. By the time of his birth, the family may have indeed been wondering for how much longer this life was going to continue. The end of the 19th century was a hard time for fishing in Norfolk. Catches were down, but costs of running the boats were up. A situation not helped for the Crasks by their growing family. John had two older brothers, Edward and Robert Nathaniel, born in 1876 and 1879. And he would soon be followed by a younger sister, born in 1883, and two more brothers in 1889 and 1896. It was during these hard times that the Crasks left Norfolk, moving north to Grimsby, when John was still a boy. When his time at school came to an end, age 14, John, as expected, joined his father and two older brothers on the boats as a deep-sea fisherman. The hours were long and the work was hard, but this would be the time in John's life that would shape his future more than any other. They would work from Grimsby until 1900, when his parents decided the family were to return to Norfolk. At first, they returned to Sheringham, but things had not improved for fishing in Norfolk, and it was just five years later that the family made a decision that for their forebears would have been unthinkable. They stepped away from fishing. They moved inland to East Dereham, where his father opened a fishmonger's shop, where he would handle the running of the business, while John and Edward would make the trip into Suffolk, to the town of Lowestoft daily, to buy the fish they needed. What might seem like a shame, to end such a long family tradition, in the long run, might have been for the best. As the fishing industry in Norfolk declined, the tourist industry began to grow, fuelled by the improved rail link from London and the newly built promenades along the seafront. And soon, the hard-working fisher folk were looked on little more than a curiosity by the hordes of visitors. So, far better a fishmonger than an unwilling tourist attraction. John was married on the 16th of July 1908 to Laura Augusta Eek in the Methodist Chapel in Deerham, a woman he had met a few years before through his church. The Crasks were a deeply Christian family and had been at a summer service held in Deerham's marketplace put on by the Salvation Army. Laura had been a worshipper there and she couldn't help but notice a tall, dark-haired young man in his fisherman's jumper standing on a box accompanied by bandsmen. Soon, the crowd fell silent, and a rather shy John Crask began to sing, Since Christ my soul from sin set free. For Laura, this was love at first sight. Shortly after they married, John and Laura moved to Swanton Morley, where, seeing the opportunity of there being no local fishmonger, set himself up as a fish hawker, selling to several villages in the area. Like he had done in all things, John would work hard in his new job, walking countless miles, to 16 to 17 hours a day, with two ponies, with baskets loaded with fish, hardly known to ever take a day off. They would move to North Earlham in 1909 to be closer to rail links and fish deliveries. While there, along with his fish hawking route, John went back to working with his father, taking a job in smoking and curing fish. They would remain there until 1914, when they returned to Deerham to open their own fish shop and smokehouse. John had never been a particularly well man, or a real picture of physical health. But sadly, the next few years would most certainly be the hardest for both him and Laura. The first two years of the First World War had little effect on the life of John. Being slightly older, 
he wasn't expected to be in the first rush of enthusiastic volunteers who rushed to the colours in 1914 and 1915. But as the war dragged on, things were about to change. It is unclear when his time came if it was as a volunteer or as a conscript, and possibly it doesn't really matter. He was classified unfit for service. Although, once again, a mystery raises its head with two possibilities. One says that it was locals who argued with authorities to get exemptions overturned, or that it was the powers that be that cancelled many of them due to the desperate need for men. But either way, John joined the army on the 9th of March, 1917. It would be during his training that his shaky health would take a nosedive. John had been away for less than a month when Laura received news that he was in the Davidson Road War Hospital in Croydon, suffering from influenza. Followed just three days later that he had suffered an abscess of the brain and had started to have attacks of nervous collapses and had forgotten who he was, his age and even his own name. All that he knew is that he wanted to go home. This was something they believed he would never recover from. He was discharged from the army and in the colourful language of the time was diagnosed as an imbecile who would end up in Thorpe Mental Asylum near the city of Norwich in August 1917. Laura would visit him every other day until the 31st of October 1918 when, inspired by her deep devotion in faith, signed him into her care. With John in no fit state to return to work, Laura and her sister reopened the fish shop to keep her and John supported until he was back on his feet. Something that would never really happen, and John would never work his former job again. While caring for John, Laura had tried to get him into drawing and painting, but with little success. He suffered from terrible stupors that lasted for months and at times years, where he did little more than stare at the wall and eat at mealtimes, often responding with, have I been away, when he came round again. The worst one came in 1920, following the death of his father that had left John confined to a wheelchair. It was their GP, Dr Dugan, who suggested the best thing they could do was take some time for John to recuperate by the sea, an opinion that was seconded by an endocrinologist. Laura and John rented a cottage called the Pigtel on the Blakeney Estuary, where they spent their days sailing, watching the fishermen passing and the birds, and soon John began to improve. They would live there for about five months before returning to Deerham. They hadn't been home long when John decided he wanted to start painting properly. Starting with the lid of an old bait box, he set to work on what would be his first creation. He soon caught the bug for it and was painting everything he could find. Box lids, cardboard, paper, doors, even teacups. The next spell by the sea would be in the village of Hursby, where a chance meeting would lead to his work being featured in galleries in London. While there, John had started making toy boats that he tried to sell to the tourists. One day, one of these passers-by was none other than the poet Valentine Auckland. The two got talking and his paintings must have been brought up, as she soon had talked him into selling her one, as she wished to show her lover, Dorothy Warren, who owned an art gallery on Maddox Street in London. Dorothy clearly loved his work, and soon Valentine returned to Norfolk, looking for John to add him to their list of artists who they displayed. Of course, Valentine didn't know John was not from Hemsby, so at first she had little luck tracking him down, but after a hunt she soon made her way to his home in Deerham. By the time she had arrived, John was now in a bad way. He had taken another turn and was confined to his bed in a near comatose state and was believed to be close to death. When Valentine first knocked on the door, Laura, recognising her from Hemsby, thought Valentine had come to demand her money back. But the opposite was true. She'd come to buy as many of his works as she could. Laura explained the situation and brought out the pictures that John had painted. And Valentine brought a considerable number of them for £20. Despite how much their lives would intermingle over the next few years, it's unclear exactly how much the Krasks knew about Valentine and her lifestyle. They must have been slightly taken aback by her strange way of dressing for the time, in men's clothes, with short hair styled into an Eton crop. But I can't help but wonder, as devout Christians, would they have dealt with her had they known she was a lesbian and a communist? Valentine would return a few months later, this time with Dorothy Warren, and were greeted with a pleasant surprise. John's condition had greatly improved and he was creating again. Although he had switched from painting to embroidery largely, it was easier for him to do in bed. The fact that he could sew and embroid as a man at this time is not a shock, as the ability to sew was a major skill needed as a fisherman to fix sails and nets. As before, the women were very keen to buy his work, 
John was seemingly a bit more business minded than his wife, though, and agreed, as long as he was paid more for the work he had spent longer to make. The first exhibition of John's work was held in August 1929 in London, something John could never have imagined when he first picked up a paintbrush. Due to his physical state, John was unable to attend it, though. It was a success, but many of the reviews he received were slightly damning with faint praise, to say the least. The Times described his work as crude, but works of art, and the Daily Mail used such terms as childishly naive, but praise from ordinary people, especially from Norfolk, were much more appreciated. When a chroma fisherman was shown a copy of the embroidery Rescue from Breach's Boy, he was quickly able to realise what was being depicted and how that kind of rescue would be carried out in real life. The success of the August exhibition would lead to another being held a short time later, but this one would not go as well, mostly due to Auckland and Warren falling out with each other and Auckland now in a relationship with writer Sylvia Townsend Warner, who she was to introduce to the quiet Norfolk artist in 1930, with Sylvia being impressed by the integrity of his work and the simple way he lived his life. It is largely down to Auckland, her partners and friends, that a lot of John's work still survives to this day. They both became his patrons, buying many of his works for themselves, as well as encouraging their friends to do the same. Cross paintings and embroideries were known to adorn many of their walls. John's health would never really improve, leading him to talking very infrequently and creating when he was able to through the 1930s, using his memories of fishing, stories from his friends, and sometimes just pure imagination to inspire his work. Despite having some of his work shown in America in the early 1940s, mostly due to the connections of his patrons, he never really gained a following outside of his dedicated fans. And it was here, in spring 1940, that John would begin his largest, and what some might call his greatest work. He had listened to the wireless, the radio, for inspiration for a while now. So, like many, he was glued to the set, listening to the unfolding situation in Europe. German paratroopers dropping into the Netherlands, tanks rolling through Belgium, British forces rushing forward to face them, the German breakthrough at Sedan, the retreat to the coast, now hundreds of thousands of troops from Britain, France, Belgium and others await evacuation, scattered in many locations along the French coast. The most famous of these locations, of course, Dunkirk. As he listened, he began work on an 11-foot-long embroidery described as his take on the bio-tapestry, depicting the scenes playing out on the beaches of Dunkirk, the most ambitious work he ever undertook, and sadly, not one he would see finished. He would work on it until his death on the 23rd of August 1943, after slipping into a coma in Norwich Hospital, aged 62, leaving a patch of sky still to do. After his passing, the tapestry was donated to Norwich Castle Museum by Laura, where it was promptly placed into storage and has never been on public display there, and was frankly looked down upon by those in charge at the time. When asked in the late 40s if they would lend the Dunkirk tapestry to an exhibition in America, the curator agreed, but put forward a simple stipulation. I do not wish to have my name associated with such an exhibition because, quite frankly, I do not think work of this type comes under the heading of art, although I'm pleased to say its current caretakers are far more open-minded. They often say that artists become more famous after their deaths, but this would not be the case for John, and it was only a relatively short time after his passing he was almost forgotten. As Julia Blackburn, the author of his biography Threads, put it when she was interviewed in 2015, he was poor, he was sick, he was a man who did embroidery, of course he was forgotten. Much of his work was lost too, unknowingly thrown away or ruined by the conditions they were kept in. Even many of those owned by Auckland and her friends suffered terrible smoke damage from their cigarettes. After Valentine's death in 1969 and Sylvia's in 1978, the paintings were left to Peter Pear, the opera tenor. It is many of these pictures that can now be found displayed in museums all over Norfolk and Suffolk. There had been small exhibitions of his work in the 1970s, but it wouldn't be until 2015 that the largest exhibition of John Crask's work was held by the Norwich University of the Arts. An event I saw advertised, but I'm a little ashamed to say, not knowing who John Crask was, I never gave it a look. Both John and Laura are buried together in Deerham Cemetery, and is much the case with stories we have covered here. Over the years, the graves fell into disrepair until a recent refurbishment, this time by John's great nephew, Trevor, and his wife, Liz. I'm going to finish off with a question. Have any of you heard of John Crask before? 
I certainly hadn't until researching topics to cover in videos. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. All of the information and pictures used can be found in the description below. Feel free to like and subscribe if you wish. This was John Kresk, from Fisherman to Artist, and this was a little bit of history.